Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Chamber of Commerce June lunch. Um, lovely to see lots of faces that we don't always see at these things. What we really try and do with the OGH lunches is tackle a topic which we know is affecting all industries across Guernsey um, and get that conversation going, continue it. Um, we'll be live streaming, so this will be available for you to share with, with anyone who wasn't able to be here today and, and carry that on. Um, and the topic we're dealing with today, we know without question, affects not only all business, but all people on the island. Um, and we're really pleased to be co-hosting it with the Sustainable Business Initiative, which is an offshoot of Chamber. Now, if anyone doesn't know, Chamber has lots of industry heads uh, representing sectors across the island. The Sustainable Business Initiative doesn't sit quite in the same way as that, because we know that sustainability and our, and our move towards a, a greener Guernsey is something that affects absolutely all sectors of Guernsey. So it's, it's an initiative rather than an industry group, um, and you'll hear a little bit more about them in a moment. Um, but before we start that uh, panel event, I'm really pleased that we're able to hear a little bit from the Health Improvement Commission, and Lucy will be coming up to talk to you in just a moment. And again, an incredibly positive uh, event that we're going to be able to bring to you today because the Health Improvement Commission is equally looking at bettering Guernsey as a whole, affecting everyone um, on the island and is doing some incredibly positive moves toward that. I'm really pleased to ask Lucy to come and join you and um, enjoy the event. I'm not used to speaking to a microphone, so I might go back and forth a bit on this. Hello, uh, thank you for having us. Thank you, Laura. Um, my name is Lucy Whitman. I'm the Healthy Awake Lead at the Health Improvement Commission. This is my colleague, Alex, who's our Eat Well Lead. Just returned from honeymoon, so I haven't subjected him. He'd normally probably be giving this talk, I'm afraid he brought me today. Um, we're just going to do a few minutes just about the, the sort of projects that we do in terms of um, our Eat Well strand. Uh, for anyone who perhaps doesn't know, the Health Improvement Commission is a charity. Uh, it was set out, it was actually born of a resolution under the Healthy Weight Strategy originally. But actually, then it was sort of taken under the partnership of purpose. It's been running from about the beginning of 2019. So we're only sort of starting to get going. And then things obviously changed dramatically. We're kind of back on track a bit now um, and um, getting going. We've got four, four main strands of, uh, of work that we work with. So uh, you can see there the Eat Well side of things, which we're going to talk about today. Healthier weight, be active. And I think some of you might have had um, uh, the luxury of uh, having our be active team down here. Alan Williams came to talk about active travel, I think. Um, and then substance use actually to, uh, works on the health improvement side of things with regards to uh, drugs, alcohol, and tobacco. So lots of strategies that the public health side of things has not given us to do uh, in terms of, of, of various actions. We're also home to the uh, social prescribing. A pilot project and again some of you might have had a chance to to hear them talk I think recently as a talk with you as well okay but today the uh, subject is our eat well strand of work you can see just there just a few examples we work across a whole age group across the life course we have a particular bias towards uh, children and young people and really that's because of that chance to work at a very early stage of setting behaviors but we do work across the life course uh, do we need to work on Eat Well? Uh, the local and the national and the global data would suggest uh, that, yes, um, it's well established that nutrition is, is paramount to health and therefore health is paramount to pretty much everything else. So, yes, we do, we do need to work on nutrition. The local data here is a mixture of, of reported, self-reported data and measured data. From Just from examples, we have about... Of about 30% of secondary students, about 40% of um, primary students eating five fruit and veg a day, which is quite an indicative uh, data that, that gets used for sort of you know, indicating um, diet quality. We have about 50% of adults reporting that. We, we're going to, that, that piece of data, we changed the question and we do wonder whether or not there was um, excitement around answer that. But let's say there's about, about half, maybe a little less for, for adults eating that sort of diet quality. Um, we, another example and probably pertinent to today, we did some uh, work fairly recently with early years lunch boxes. We looked at about 170 early years lunch boxes, what they took to school and what they actually then ate. Of course, this tends to be different. Uh, in those boxes, you had a whole range. You had lots of fruit. I mean, sometimes we saw the same banana going in and out all week, but there was lots, plenty of fruit. About a third of boxes had veg in them. 
uh, a real dominance of processed meat and a dominance of, of white bread and quite a lot of sugary uh, items. This is just a snapshot of, of the sorts of data, and, and I'd like to go on really, and the important part is, is, is the why, the influences why, rather than any sort of finger, none of the work we do is finger pointing, it's all about learning and understanding the drivers behind the behavior, seeing what we can do with that. So, uh, talking of that, the influence, I don't know if you'll be able to read this, don't worry too much, the, the, the main point from that side is the complexity of the influences on what we actually end up eating. The bottom right-hand corner with the left for you um, is, is an individual side of things. So you have got an element in there of knowledge. It, it, does, it does play a role, but it only plays a small role. Um, also within there, you've got things like uh, genetics, uh, income levels. So just pausing on genetics, we're all designed to search out food. That is a strong drive that we've had. It's an innate one, particularly foods that are high in salt, uh, sugar, and fat. Uh, and to some degree, we're, we're, we, we have that, that driver at very different, depending on our genetics, that driver really does vary between all of us. The same with our efficiency on actually storing that energy, all sorts of vulnerabilities that we have in terms of genetics that make us very different. But at the bottom of that, we all are looking for that sort of food, which commercially is obviously quite beneficial to get in now. Uh, just in terms of income too, I just wanted to highlight, uh, the obviously the influence of your income level is significant. I've just got another slide on the next one here which if we're looking about the, the uh, cost of living side of things right now is particularly influential and getting more and more influential in this, the decisions we make in terms of what we're actually able to eat, our real true options. And we're experiencing all of this. I don't know if you can see that. That's in terms of our food security is really compromised. And we see that the full span right down to experience the hunger here in Australia. Just slightly, just, does it go back? Oh, I don't know if it does. Don't worry. Um, the other parts of that, that complex side we're looking at were sectors, uh, settings, so things like the importance of schools, of uh, early years settings, of shop commerce, and then the broader um, uh, uh, sectors such as, as the laws behind uh, marketing, the laws behind agriculture, etc. All of those work together to influence what we actually individually start eating. And that's why where we decide to work is really influenced by that sort of thing. So this is just an example of uh, the large scale food manufacturing processes. That sector is massive now, obviously, but there's a big drive to produce a lot of quite highly processed food at cheap cost, which is then filtering down to our own um, choices. You can see on the bottom there, the change in portion sizes over years, where we've had this expectation of value for money. So you can see that some sort of attempt at scale of how things have actually changed in terms of sizes. The three in the middle are just an example of where our eating environment is influenced by the fact there are so many places to get to eat now, usually quite highly processed, healing for that state ability again. So you've got, you know, you can buy food in a petrol station, a clothes shop, in a chemist, and usually, as I say, it's a certain kind of food. Marketing is massive business, obviously, particularly towards children, uh, and uh, quite recently even, the, the, the laws that might shape that uh, have actually been really watered down. Uh, this is another example of what they call sports washing. So that's KP did a massive uh, sponsorship of teams recently on the cricket team. Again, highly influential and in food choices. And the last one is just about culture, our value of food. We have a hate culture, which is quite prevalent um, across a lot of working practices. That's um, something that we kind of accept and sometimes even get cross about if we want biscuits at a meeting. But all those things add together to kind of Oh, it goes one by one. So that leads us to the sorts of places that we're working. I'll be, probably be really quick. We're on six minutes. Um, uh, in the earlier side of things, we have a really supportive early years sector here. They are amazing. State's early years team really get the influence that the early years settings can have on setting uh, little people up for their uh, eating behaviours during life. So they actually have a policy now. We, we, we've built a policy with them that goes across the span of their work. So it's what's taught, what's served, how uh, staff role model, all impact uh, on little people. So we're busy uh, working with all the early years that have that policy now and be inspected on it. And um, we're slowly rolling that out. In the meantime, we do lots of other projects with them just to make things easier for them. So we've had 23 of the settings all wanted to get involved in free veg hampers that we delivered with special knives. 
fingers off with. So that's based on that whole experiential learning. And we've had, um, I think, up to about a thousand children involved in trying out different types of veg. Uh, the most recent one we've done was a growing gang. So we delivered lots of seeds and potatoes and things across. I think we had about 14 settings involved, and they're just harvesting now. But our first potato salad produced by little people only of about three or four years old. So these are the things that we kind of enhance their, their kind of approach. To um, is a green bit coming or white? I'm not sure. Um, quite a similar approach in schools, but it's very different kind of beef. So there is um, a, a, a food and goods in schools policy that's supposed to be applied across schools. Again, it has that whole span from learn to how teachers role model through to cooking skills in, and what is served in school. Big span, it's even working with days. It's been very challenging, I can't imagine, trying to work with schools when they are trying to do a lot of catch up and a lot of just keeping things together. So we're leaving here to go and talk to the primary sector and get some really big progress here. Um, in the meantime, we've also been working with the school catering side of things and making a phased approach with um, bringing to um, school food standards. School food standards uh, drive the provision, hopefully, towards improving. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, uh, items that, that, that would overlap here. So, again, it's that really increase in alternative proteins. It's looking at a lot of whole grains, et cetera. But it's a very, very phased approach. So, um, it will take time. Um, College of FB, which I think is one of the projects that Jennifer perhaps mentioned. We've done some work. It's interesting. The students there actually were keen to eat well, but they, they said, we can't see what's on offer. So we bought them some, um, some big units. I'll just show you in one moment. We've had a 50% increase in the amount of fruit and veg that gets ordered and eaten just with changing the actual uh, the environment itself and listening to what the students wanted. So we've got a wrap station, which... Um, uh, goes through all of the three outlets now, which has been really encouraging. And then the last one is oh, that's off. Um, uh, the last one was just working again with the with states outlets themselves and the private sector. Now we started with states outlets, so both Azure and the hospital are our first places that we're working with to trial out something called community nutrition standards. That's a procurement kind of standard, which again would drive. Um, the, the provision towards um, a, a healthier offer as best as we can. Sports clubs and things, I can see the top really examples of our policies. You don't need to worry about that. They're just the complex rep they, they take into account. And just some pictures now. The top one is the menu that is now at the College of FE with the picture of the, the new unit. Uh, the little people they're growing and they're chopping support the sports, um, uh, street sports with their trialing of, of um, veg and things. But that just gives you an idea. Sorry, is that right? <laughs> that's our just in case you want to contact. Um, super. Um, so my name is Jennifer Strachan. I'm with Rollo to summarize uh, one of the co-leads of the Sustainable Business Initiative. Um, before we get on to the main event, which is our speakers, just wanted to touch on what we're trying to do. Um, so within Chamber, we're really trying to be the voice to help local businesses become more sustainable. Quite simple, but it's incredibly complicated. So here we are with one topic that you're already seeing the complexity that's involved just in our food systems. Um, but we believe that there are real opportunities for Guernsey, and we are trying to um, just keep that conversation going. So how are we doing that? We're trying to inspire businesses, and we also get involved a little bit in influencing government policy. And Core to what we're trying to do is really to emphasize the three main steps to becoming a sustainable business. First of all, decide to act. It sounds simple, but actually it's trying to find that time to give those resources to act. One way to do that is to appoint a champion. Um, and we strongly believe in applying a framework to make sure that you're measuring and uh, putting a baseline and really understanding where you're, you're moving forward. Um, we have a sustainability champions program. So within your company, if you've identified one person who is your champion, maybe sits on a sustainability committee, um, we really want to start cross-fertilizing all the knowledge and all the great practices that we're starting to see coming out of Guernsey businesses. Um, so we have a program where we um, support those, get them together, create a networking piece. Um, so you hopefully, if you want to get involved, um, find out more about us, um, we will be able to engage you on that. 
So that's a quick run through what we're trying to do. Now onto the main event. We've got three speakers lined up. We're going to have a, a lovely um, lunch, and then we're going to afterwards we're going to have a panel discussion. So you can start as they're speaking, coming up with some good questions for our speakers. So first up, I'd like to invite Jock up to talk to us about his work in the soil farm and food systems. I'm going to try this mic so I can move around a little bit. Thank you, Jennifer. Let's see if we got a slide. Yeah. So for those that don't know, um, I work at the soil farm part of my time. My partner, Sasha, works there full time. Um, at the soil farm, we work in regeneration of soil health. I'll very briefly tell you what that means. It means that when we interact with soil, we improve it. So whether we're taking food from it or whether we're treating it as a landscape, as an amenity site, typically practices can reduce the health of soil and therefore the landscape. And particularly when we're making food, we're taking nutrient out of the system the whole time. So our work in regenerating soil is about improving soil as we engage with it. Um, we do some work in assessment, testing, reporting, consultancy type work. And we also collect a number of um, waste streams locally and compost them to make biology, essentially, that we return into soil systems. So very brief nutshell of what we do at the soil farm. Um, we started doing that because of uh, our interest in food and the knowledge that to get nutrient into food, you need healthy soil. So that's why we started work at the soil farm. And when Jennifer asked me to look at the subjects of food sustainability, my immediate thought was this is not an easy subject. It's, um, it's already been alluded to twice. It's really complex. It goes deep in many, many different directions. And I think it's really quite easy to take food sustainability as a kind of a, a light, simple switch choice. And I think perhaps the only switch that is simple is the one in each of our heads to choose to engage differently with food. And I think that's perhaps where the biggest change is gonna be found is the ability to make different decisions. So what I'm gonna try and do for you today, Viv and Jill are gonna follow me. I'm gonna stay fairly high and talk a little bit about some data and some, some decision-making frameworks that I've been using on my own journey through engaging with food. Um, and then I'll hand the baton over. So understanding it's complex, I, over 10 years, 12 years, I've been experiencing all sorts of different data points that point at, at this. I'll run you through some. This one shocked me, 96% of the mammals on earth are us or the food we're eating. There's only 4% left that is wild animals. I think that number is quite shocking. If we put that into birds, we're obviously taking us out of the equation here, but 71% of the birds on earth are domesticated or poultry. Again, quite it just suggests an imbalance. When we look at that in land use terms, over 35%, over a third of the land on earth is used for food production, whether that's animals or food production. Um, and when you look at the effects of that on biodiversity, you can see over here, the food system is top of the chart in every single category of, um, we're already using, uh, you know, in, in all systems, in marine, in land, um, and this is habitat loss, mortality, and other. So food's having a huge impact on the planet we live on. And if you look at that broken down land use per kilo of food, you can see beef is a big player. And it doesn't mention every food type here, but you'll get some of the indicators. Beef, dark chocolate, coffee, chicken, cheese are all pretty heavy on, on land use. Shift that into water use, and cheese suddenly plays a much bigger part. But the same players are in the mix. Rice is obviously moves up the scale with the paddies. And when you look at that at greenhouse gas emissions, we're talking about beef, cheese, dark chocolate, chicken, coffee are also having a, a huge um, impact on our planet. And to put that into context by sector, currently agriculture is at least 24, 25%. If we assume that they're not factoring transportation buildings and electricity production in some of that agricultural number. Um, but, uh, oh, jump forward one. And then when you break down that 25% of um, emissions from the food system, it surprised me a little 
Viv pointed at this data point that around 75% of it is not the transport and packaging and things that you might immediately go to and think, oh, that's where the problem is. It's a problem, but most of it is in how we're making food. And when I look at that wall of data, those numbers, I kind of, for me, given the insight, I've got my mind immediately goes here and says that I don't think it's necessarily always about what we're eating, what's on the plate. I think that has a big part in the current systems, but it's more the way that food's coming to the plate. And I qualified this point because someone I was, uh, Laura was talking to earlier said that so often we see these data points and they come out of the US and we think, oh, that's how they're eating and not how we're eating. But in the UK, 90% of the chicken that lands on our plate comes from this type of system. And I think people don't always necessarily think that European food is coming from that same system. And there's some data points that I won't share because you're about to eat, but 900 million of NHS costs a year against supermarket chicken. I'll leave you with that one. Um, so this intensive farming system, I would much rather see chicken produced this way, which means we need to eat less of it. Um, 86 million a year of those chickens produced from that system in the UK never even make it into us. They're getting thrown into the bin before we eat them. There's this kind of waste in the system as well. And I think the price point on that is, is relevant. You can buy a whole chicken at £2.89. And when the price of food is so low, I don't think we necessarily put the value on it that we should. So I think there is a relationship with price that we need to talk about. And Sasha keeps pointing me to this phrase, which I quite like, and it's not the cow, it's the how. And I think we need to think about what systems we are backing when we, when we engage with food. So why does all this global statistics matter when we're thinking about food? Well, again, I'm not gonna be 100% qualified on these numbers, but every time I talk to, uh, to those in, our, in, in the States, in politics, in civil servants, I get a rough nod that we're in the right ballpark here. And these numbers, I think, were from co-op data 10 years ago, but they don't, haven't changed a huge amount. So something like 90% of the food we eat on Ireland is imported. So those global stats and those UK stats matter a lot because that's where we're getting our food from. Around 7% of the 11% left that we produce on Ireland is milk, which not very diverse if we're thinking about the whole diet. So that leaves 4% of the food we consume on Ireland produced on Ireland. And where I go to with that is how much of it is produced sustainably or is produced without chemicals in the system because that's the way we're choosing to eat. And I suspect it's a percent of a percent. I suspect it's quite a very, very small amount. And I also think when we start to think about that in terms of the question of sustainability, we're not just thinking about, is the food still going to be there tomorrow? It's how is it grown? What's the impact on the environment? Is it even on the shelf in the supermarket if there's rough weather? All these different questions come out. So how much of that is produced sustainably? Oh, we've got a sensitive clicker, Joe. There we go. So for me, where we start is in terms of my decision-making framework, what I've come to realize is that every single pound we put into the system is a vote. And I think it's potentially more important than the vote I get every four years for my political um, choices, because I get to do this every day. And I get to vote for the systems that I wanna see. So for every pound I spend, it's a vote, and not just for the food I'm choosing, but the, the secondary implications of those choices that I'm making. So I think every pound we spend, really, really important. And the first question I ask, and I'm going to run you through a couple of different questions. They're probably in the order that I choose them, but everyone will have a slightly different framework of how they're engaging. So for me, how it's produced is priority number one because how it's produced has a direct impact on the quality of the food, the nutrient density, the landscape it's grown in, and the benefit to the people growing it. So is it organic or better still regenerative? Organics are standard, but you can still grow organically and reduce the quality of landscape over time. You can still be putting inputs into it. So for me, regenerative um, standards are far better where we're improving land. Is it free of synthetic chemicals, preservatives, and GMOs? For me, it's a must. Getting the chemicals out of our food system is huge. And I look at this through the lens of particularly my seven-year-old daughter since she came into the world. I look at the food system through the lens of what we're handing to her. And I kind of look at the data that comes out of the food system and think we've got to do something better. 
Um, so getting chemicals out of the system, which is also the water system, biodiversity into our seas and these kind of things. For me, that's a big player. So is it harming the habitats or the environment we're growing it in? Are we choosing this kind of monocrop chemical food system or are we choosing this kind of diverse locally grown um, food system? And on the right here are some of the things that come out of that if we play the right cards for me, soil health, water, biodiversity, the quality and welfare of the, the animals, the biodiversity of the farmers in the system, whether it's seasonal and whether it's um, resilient. I was going to share with you, I think there is one there, yeah, it comes in a minute. Um, the next for me is where it's produced. I try and buy local wherever I can, but that 4% doesn't go very far. And um, we need to we need to improve on that. A little plug for our hedge veg on the left, but this, this image here made me smile or cry. <laughs> um, hairs grown in Argentina, packed in Thailand and eaten in the UK, just sums up for me some of the problems we've got. So is it produced locally, nearby? How far has that food traveled is the next question for me. And it's important for nutrient density as well, because when it was picked, is also important to what's still in it. The longer it's out of the ground, the less nutrients are in it. So the faster we can get it on the plate, the better. And is it supporting farmers and their community? I think is another big player for me. Um, food is about putting um, nutrients into us, but welfare back into community. And then for the, through the lens of our children, I think, is it investing in the future? This is another part for me in my choices are we improving our food security? This is a familiar site, um, I'm sure, if you're shopping in the supermarkets locally, whether it's weather, whether it's season, whether it's all too often there's empty shelves. I'd far rather be investing in this system and having some more resilience. Is the price appropriate for the product? I think is huge because I think this comes back to that switch and some of the responsibility we have. I refuse to buy a three pound chicken. I refuse to buy a box that says duck for four with a quid on it. Um, I just, for me, it has to cost more in order for it to be relevant. Um, I was drinking some of James's apple juice this morning and my daughter <laughs> talked about it as like, this is great apple juice from Rockettes locally. And yeah, it's more expensive than the cheap carton one on the shelf, but you know how it's grown, you know what it's produced, you know it's local. And I think these are the decisions that I'm choosing to make they are more expensive. And so I'm having to make other life choices to accommodate that. So, but if it's seasonal at the moment, we can sell you courgettes pretty cheap. <laughs> They're coming out the ground thick and fast. I was trying to persuade Sasha to bring a box full and put them on the side so everyone could take one home for free. But I don't think she has. Um, but I, for me, it's the supply chain issues. And if we, if we do see more of this, how long does that 4% last us? I think there's a food security question as well. The question of waste, I think when we look at cost, waste is also something we can ask the question of, because I think when you look at it, there's waste right the way through the system. From what's dictated by buyers to the farmers and external weather factors and COVID factors and these kind of things, but also the transit time damage, unsold goods, how much it gets wasted on the shelf and never makes it to the customer, how much gets wasted in preparation and consumption. And I know Jill is going to talk about some really positive steps happening in the OGH here about that. Um, and then people always talk about the wonky, the unsold, the damaged. And I think we can do more with that as well if we turn it into, um, you know, convenience foods, into chutneys and things. That wonky food doesn't need to go to waste. So waste, I think, is a big issue that we can improve our food system. And, and then really coming towards a little bit of a conclusion from me on this bigger picture side is what's the upside of improving our food system? locally of considering food sustainability or well, besides the great tasting clean local food supply i kind of figure there's a few <laughs> um health and well-being clear energy nutrition resilience a culinary culture i don't know about you guys but whenever i travel europe i can pretty much think italy i can tell you kind of i'm starting to think food straight away and greece and these other places they have a food identity and i think guernsey's surf and turf ought to be top of the menu with our seafood and our cow and these other areas, but we should be adding um, more resilient local food supply into that. I think there's huge opportunity for employment as well, and it doesn't have to be low grade um, employment. I think with the right approach, we can 
make some interesting employment opportunities. So as I hand over to, to Viv to take the mic from Plantier, I'll just leave you with a, a few takeaways, a cheeky pun on the imagery, but Vivian asked me to leave you with some takeaways. So the, there we go. I think 1% change per day, change the whole system really quickly. Every pound you spend is a vote. Please think wisely how you spend your pound and ask questions of your food providers, because unless you're asking the question, they don't necessarily know that you're looking for change, particularly in restaurants and things as uncomfortable as that can be. I'll hand you over to Viv. Thank you all for listening. I'm not going to use the mic because I'm not going to try and coordinate two things because I'll end up speaking into this. <clears throat> um, uh, so I am co-founder of Plant Here. We set up Plant Here about three and a half years ago with the aim of seeing plant-based options on menus everywhere. Um, <clears throat> at this point, I want to reassure you, I am not here to preach or convert to plant-based eating. This is all about balance, I think that's what we're talking about today. It's balance and it's about considered, empowered, conscious decisions. Um, so personally, about eight years ago, I changed my eating, um, cooking behaviours uh, for health reasons. Um, I have reaped the benefits immensely, um, and that's completely inspired a change in direction for me. I was one of those marketeers working in food, um, selling you those things that really don't do you or the environment any good. So I, I'm hoping that I've joined the brighter side. Um, so when I moved from being vegetarian, I was vegetarian for a long, long time. Um, I personally didn't like the taste of meat. Um, and I think what comes through here is that there are lots and lots of different reasons for our food choices. I want to say it's a deeply, deeply personal choice. And I know that food is a, a very difficult topic to cover. Um, it affects lots of our kind of traditions, uh, cultural norms. Um, and so it's great to be able to put this literally onto the table today. Um, but when I moved from being vegetarian to plant-based, what I thought was going to happen uh, and the mindset that I was adopting was one of restriction. I was thinking about all the things that I wouldn't be able to have, but actually what I found is a mindset of an abundance, of abundance. And really my diet is so much broader a result of making those changes. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, Jock's talked about what's going on in the environment, and I think it's important to have a look at what's actually going on with our eating behaviours. So I've just broken this down by age, and this is a recent YouGov survey in the UK. Up here, we've got the 18 to 24-year-olds, 52% of them. So this green block on the, on the left shows um, meat eaters. And, and this survey asked all the respondents to choose just one dietary choice, which I think a lot of us would struggle to do at the moment, but they had to select just one dietary choice. 52% classified themselves as a meat eater. Compare that to the over 65s, where 79% would classify as a meat eater. So there's a 27 percentage point difference between those age groups. And you can see that step change moving down with each generation. Um, and then within that, the 18 to 24 year olds, 20% identify as flexitarian and 19% don't eat meat at all. So there's quite a big shift happening and it's not really much of a surprise because the number one worry for 18 to 24 year olds is the environment. But that's not the only reason that we're changing our eating behaviours. 55% would say that health is the driving force, 49 from animal welfare and 30 from the environment. And I think documentaries on Amazon and Netflix, things like What the Health, Cowspiracy, Seaspiracy, Game Changers, are putting information about our food systems right at our fingertips. And we are seeing a real mindset shift as a result of those documentaries. Quite often when I'm speaking to clients or speaking at events, their changes have come off the back of these documentaries, which is really quite a powerful tool to be empowered with the knowledge of what's actually going on behind the scenes and digging deeper than those food labels. 
Oops, it is sensitive. Um, so just want to delve into health a little bit more and, and why it is that people are changing their eating behaviours and moving towards a more plant-based diet. We tend to think our health happens to us, but actually about 20%, less than 20% of our risk of disease comes from our genes, our genetics. Over 80% comes from our lifestyle choices. Now, I find that a really, really empowering statistic that I have in my gift, the ability to change uh, the fate of my grandparents and their parents before them. And the number one indicator of our health is what we eat, is our gut health. Um, and gut health is quite a hot topic at the moment. There's so much research coming through um, and I'm a little bit of a self-confessed nerd about, about gut health, but I think it's just so important that we become more aware of it and the impact that our food choices are having every time we eat, not just when we're older, but literally the habits that we're forming when we're children. 20% of the food that we're eating goes to our brain. That's a pretty scary thought. You know, when we're fueled on coffee or Haribo, which a lot of the kids are, and we see this kind of crazy behavior in schools or, you know, people slumped on their desks in the afternoon, any surprise when what we're eating is literally connected our brain and our gut are physically connected by the vagus nerve so there is this constant dialogue an unhealthy brain will lead to an unhealthy gut and an unhealthy gut will lead to an unhealthy brain so what's the best way for us to be able to get a healthy gut well there is an ongoing research that has found that eating a minimum of 30 different plant-based foods whole foods um, is what gives us a healthy gut. And that's because they are full of fiber. Um, and Lucy, you were talking about the, the five a day, the 30 a week sometimes freaks people out because thinking, oh, just about cracked five a day. But like you say, Lucy, a lot of them are the same things over and over again. You know, maybe we have a banana for breakfast and the cucumber and tomato at lunch. And, you know, maybe some tin tomatoes in the evening, a bit of frozen peas or sweet corn for a bit of speed but it's about this diversity and it goes beyond fruit and vegetables into grains and pulses nuts and seeds and herbs and spices and it needs to be quality um i read this really frightening statistic the other day that said um there's 10,000 preservatives in our food space one percent of those have been tested the other 99% have been classified as GRAS, which sounds quite scriptable. But what it means is generally recognized as safe. So we are literally walking guinea pigs for the preservatives, the ingredients that are being put into our, uh, into our foods and particularly into our processed foods. And I think the danger that we have is that gut health and plant-based are being slapped onto foods across the supermarket. And as, uh, as we're desperately trying to change our food behaviors to be healthy, to be more sustainable, we're led by these messages, what's on the front of a pack. You know, we're steered by that and, and we're being fed these preservatives, these ingredients, and quite often you turn a pack over. And if you can't understand the ingredients, if you can't pronounce them or visualize them, I would put that pack back on the shelf. And also, just while I'm on uh, food industry bashing, um, the bliss point is one to, to really be aware of. This was developed in the 60s and is this combination of sugar, fat and salt, which keeps us going back for more. Think about Pringles. They are literally the kind of epitome of bliss points. And not only have they done it with the ingredients, they've done it with the slogan as well. Once you pop, you can't stop. It's almost like a challenge to us to just keep going and see if we can actually get to the bottom of the tube. Um, one of the other kind of common issues I think that we find when we're transitioning and, and trying to work out what food to eat is, um, and quite a few people have mentioned this to me recently, is the pasta vegetarian, where you know we take something out and then we just bulk up what we have been eating. Um, and that can leave us feeling tired, bloated, gassy. And actually what we need to do is rather than taking out, it's about replacing. It's about making sure that we continue to have this balance. 
Typically, a plate would be about 50% fruit and veg, 25% protein, 25% carbohydrate. And it's thinking about those alternative protein sources, the beans and the lentils. And this, <clears throat> the, the blue zones. Anyone heard of the blue zones? Yeah, quite a few nods. So these are five regions across the world uh, where they have the highest uh, living number of centenarians. Uh, and what's interesting about this is that they are spread across four different continents. So it's not just a, a local culture or genetics. What it's based on is nine consistent lifestyle characteristics that are helping them to live long, happy and healthy lives. One of those characteristics is their 95% plant slant diet. So they're replacing their protein with beans and lentils for the majority of the time, but they still enjoy meat. But when they enjoy it, it's about once a month. And the portion size, this is the kind of really interesting one. The portion size is about the size of a deck of cards. So when you think about the portion sizes that we see in restaurants or on supermarket shelves, there's a huge difference. So like Jock was saying, it's not just about the animal, but it's about the quantity as well. So why does this matter? I mean, wouldn't you love to see the Blue Zones? Wouldn't you love Guernsey to be on that Blue Zones list? It would be amazing if we could do that for our community. And what we've achieved before, is there anything that could stop us? Well, I could think of a few things, but we can work on them. Um, but for your team, for putting this into an organizational setting, having a thriving team, reaping the benefits of, of an energized, focused, concentrated team that has good decision-making, reduced absenteeism. How can we do that? By putting food into those meetings, taking the biscuits out. What we're, what we're thinking about doing is putting food that's gonna help us thrive, give us the energy and give us the focus we need rather than dive into an afternoon post-lunch nap. So it's thinking about, you know, what are we putting on for those breakfast meetings? What are we putting on at lunchtime? Are we really feeding? Are we really feeding and nourishing ourselves? And it's also thinking about value alignment. Thinking about these um, 18 to 24 year olds that are coming into the workforce, thinking about the food choices that they're making. They wanna be able to see a sustainability strategy that runs deeper than website copy. They want it to be able to run through every aspect of the business. And that's what's going to help them make their decision about where they want to work and what they want to do. Um, a little bit of a provocative line, the vegan always chooses. But this is quite true. If you have a vegan in your family or in your team and you're going for a meal out, you have to go wherever caters for that person. Um, and I've had some pretty catastrophic experiences. Um, quite often there's a menu and they'll say, right, you can have this with without this, this, or this, okay? That would be vegetables again. Um, or somebody, I've had a waitress put my uh, dessert down and she said, so sorry, yours doesn't look as good as everybody else's. Think about the way that you're communicating, what's written on the menu, what's written on your website, and how you speak to the customers. We had a, uh, we had a buffet fairly recently and um, I walked in and I was over the moon to see vegan food as part of that buffet. Then I looked down the other end of the table to the plates of normal food. It's thinking differently about our food choices. As I say, the, the generations, our food choices are changing and it's about reflecting that in, in every aspect. So kind of moving on from what Jock was saying, how do you wanna spend your pound? What's your priority list? For me, organic will always be at the top. It's not always accessible and it's not always affordable. I'm very aware of that. Um, but when I, I would prioritize my spend on food over anything else in, the, in a similar way. Um, but for me, organic, I would rather have less chemicals in my food, but have it packaged. Wouldn't it be brilliant if we had an option of organic unpackaged food? But at the moment, we're at a point where we have to make decisions and it's thinking about what is your priority list. Ooh. And I think quite often in our quest to do something 100%, to be perfect, 
we find ourselves not making any progress at all because it's overwhelming. We're talking about a lot of different areas of food today. And I think it's about being able to just pick one thing, that one thing that starts you on a journey to making changes because those small steps lead to long-term transformation. Um, and there's a brilliant tool called Crowding Out that you can use to be able to help you with that transition. So rather than taking out, you know, that example of the, the pasta, you're taking out the, the protein, think about replacing rather than removing. The crisp habit is a is a is something that's carried over from our kind of childhood packed lunches into our uh, meal deals on the high street now. So what we need to do is think about how we can take that start to take that out maybe four days a week instead of five, and we have something different, and then we move it down to three days. So rather than seeing this as a whole big change, take it step by step. So just in summary, we had to have three takeaways balance the plate, create your priority list and crowd out rather than try and do everything. I'd like to pass over to Jill now, who is Director of Sales um, for Guernsey Red Carnation Hotels. Um, and she's gonna talk to us about the sustainability journey that the OGH and the Duke of Richmond have and continue to be on. Thanks, Viv. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those who have not had the opportunity to chat to, I am Jill Mabbitts, and I am I represent the Red Carnation Hotel Collection. So you, usually I'll find me here at the OGH or up at the Duke of Richmond Hotel. Um, and while talking about sustainability and sitting on panels isn't in my usual day to day, I hope I can give you just a bit of a flavour of what Red Carnation Hotels has achieved so far. We currently have 18 hotels in our collection soon to be 19, with uh, 100 Princess Street in Edinburgh open up this year. I've got to mention that because I'm particularly excited about that one. I should say also that uh, food will start to be served as I'm talking. They're not trying to get me to sit down. Um, the Red Carnation Hotel collection is part of 40 travel brands. Um, we make up the Travel Corporation, and that was started by our late chairman, Stanley Tobin's father, Solomon, in 1920. Stanley sadly passed away in December last year, but he was most proud of seeing 100 years of his family business. Brett Tolman, Stanley's son, is TTC's chairman, and the Red Carnation Hotel Collection's president and founder is B. Tolman, wife of Stanley, known for wearing a red carnation in his lapel. And the hotel collection follows B and Stanley's love story and truly is a family-owned and family-run business. Twelve years ago, we asked the question, how do we make travel matter? And we formed the Trade Right Foundation, which is a not-for-profit organisation ensuring that our impact on the planet we call home, the people we visit, and the rich wildlife that we find there is a positive one. In September 2020, we launched our How Do We Trade Right five-year road to net zero. And I spoke a bit about that last year at a chamber event. I'm delighted today to share some of the progress just over the last 12 months. The global goals were established by the United Nations in 2015 as a blueprint to achieve sustainable development now and into the future. And at TTC, we've used these global goals to identify sustainability issues within our business that we can positively impact through our brand operations and through our Trade Right Foundation. While recognising the importance of achieving all the goals, we've identified 11 that we can have the most impact as a travel company. And we focus our sustainable initiatives covering six key areas, climate, food, waste, experiences, diversity, and wildlife. But how does that relate to our sustainable food operation here in Guernsey? There are three specific areas I've time to chat about today. I think we all spoke about condensing what we want to say into 10 minutes is a bit of a challenge, but then um, I'll have a go. We believe that food holds value not only in telling a story, but in relaying the values of those delivering the story. And as a brand, we continue to promote our passion for protecting place and planet through our food. And to tell the story through how we waste and source our food, as well as the dishes that we serve. In the last 12 months, our vigilance in reducing food waste has resulted in a total decrease of food waste by 39% across our 18 hotels placing us on target to hit 50% by 2025. And we've achieved this in a number of ways. 
one of which is working with Winnow Solutions, which is a system offering groundbreaking AI technology, providing us with an insight into unnecessary food waste across our hotels by photographing and weighing our food waste. Winnow's mission is to create a movement of chefs to inspire others to see that food is too valuable to waste. We installed Winnow Solutions in our hotels in 2021, and we certainly had our challenges. Each of our hotels are very different. Every kitchen is different, both in terms of the layouts and operation. And for Winnow to work effectively, every item on every dish has to be uploaded. We're known for purchasing beautiful historic buildings rather than building purpose-built hotels. So there are no set places for our kitchens to be situated when it comes to Wi-Fi. If you book a hybrid meeting here at the OGH or the Duke of Richmond, you'll have a fantastic signal. But if you're in a kitchen somewhere, you might have to stand on one leg and wave your arms in the air. So that also needed investment to make sure we were suitably connected. And most importantly, for a system like this to work, we needed buy-in from our teams. We had to reassure our teams this is a, a tool to allow us not to criticise, but to help us reduce our waste. They use two metrics to measure our food waste. We use grams per cover, which focuses on the waste and volume, and also waste as a percentage of sales, which focuses on waste at a cost. The reduction in our food waste is definitely down to the buy-in from our teams. The behavioural changes in the kitchens, teams' attitude to food waste, what works, what can we do differently? And particularly when chefs saw the associated cost of the waste discarded. Reviewing the data property by property has given us some great insights into where waste is coming from, but it's also affirmed that there isn't a generic solution that can be applied across the different properties. Quite the contrary, each of our properties still perform in different ways and have a bespoke set of targets that will allow them to focus on the areas they need to. To give a few examples, um, and apologies, we are actually peering into the bins of the OGH just before we have lunch, um, but the most wasted item in terms of waste at Ashford Castle is bread. And this allowed us to look into why is that occurring? Is it overproduction? Is it plate waste? Um, and looking into it further, we could either produce less of it or trial another bread. Um, you'll see here in Guernsey, a lot of our food waste is sandwich trimmings. And we haven't yet found a solution for that as the crust feature sandwich fillings. So they can't be reused for breadcrumbs, but it's something that we're, we're talking about. Do we sacrifice our presentation in order to, to um, improve our food waste? And in Guernsey alone, in April, we threw away 147 kilograms of orange skin at the OGH. So our chefs are now competing to produce the, the best marmalade. And that goes perfectly with the honey we hope to start producing from our beehive. We're uh, patiently waiting for a swarm. Seemingly, we have an 80% chance this year. Um, a number of our hotels produce honey. We, we produce 660 pounds every year across the hotels. Um, so great to have our first beehive here in Guernsey. And, and just a bit on material waste, um, as it's not just about reduction on food waste. In addition to an 88% reduction in our printed brochures and transferring a large proportion of our guest information into electronic form, we are proactive in the commitment to eliminate unnecessarily, unnecessary single-use plastics. Um, when I spoke at the event last year, we had eliminated 46 single-use plastics in Guernsey alone, and that's now up to 51. Um, you know, offering glass bottled water, although we do also tell our guests it's perfectly safe to, to drink our, our lovely Guernsey water. But we also use vegware boxes um, compared to our previous takeaway boxes, and we have those events and, and uh, available for people to take food away when appropriate. Um, and we are actually seeing a lot of differences when people book events now with their choices, which is great. Since the launch of our five year sustainability strategy, we have made strides towards the target of delivering enriching travel experiences that are environmentally conscious and protective. As a company of travel lovers, we know what makes an impactful travel experience that benefits the places that we explore. The Treadright team produced an online assessment tool which is exclusive to Red Carnation Hotels and our sister brands. When our guests choose a Make Travel Matter experience, they can be certain that they're directly advancing the global efforts to achieve the United Nations global goals. And so far we have six um, travel, make travel matter experiences in Guernsey. They're currently experiences with Dave Bartram. We do a cattle and coastline educating guests in our biodiversity and the importance of the steers on Bunker Hill, a bee experience, hopefully with our swarm, 
and uh, Patonk and Gosh. If anyone knows Dave, they'll know he's extremely knowledgeable and not only looks after the steers at Bunker Hill, he is a beekeeper and uh, very knowledgeable. He's also the president of the Patonk Association. But Dave's experiences have been chosen for the positive impact that they have on the traveller and the communities that we explore. These experiences advance the United Nations Global Goal 12, responsible consumption, and Goal 15, production of life on land. We also have three experiences uh, with Jill Gerard, all of which end up at her family farmhouse, where guests sample local produce, including cheese, cider, apple juice, chocolate, fudge, and slow gin. These experiences directly advance Goal 11, sustainable cities and communities, and goal 12, responsible consumption and production. These are incredibly valuable relationships for us that our guests really appreciate too. And the third area I wanted to chat about is diversity. And I know from our planning discussions um, of the event, diversity came up for us all, but in completely different ways, which is great. Um, for me, it's about learning from each other and giving everyone an equal voice. And while our Red Carnation Sustainability Committee is headed up by our MD, he doesn't claim to have all the answers. We launched IDEA, which stands for Inclusivity, Diversity, Equity and Action, and aims to celebrate our diverse cultures and experiences. We have 32 different nationalities working in Guernsey alone. We hope to drive awareness and education around identities and empower and motivate employee career growth within the group. When it came to the topic of plant-based diets and our menus, it was Jonathan's PA who put together a presentation for the company on plant-based diets. Joss is vegan, who'd experienced some of the same um, challenges that frustrations that Viv had spoke about earlier, going out to restaurants and being presented with a plate of uninteresting vegetables. And just some of the points that Joss covered in her presentation, this isn't new, you know, this is both younger and older generations are increasingly choosing to eat a flexitarian diet. For environmental reasons. Every dish needs a hero protein. A plate should have all its components. Give the customer something to have their eyes to focus on, which is exciting, which isn't necessarily a vegetable. And don't forget the dessert options for vegan guests. Don't forget the side dishes when accompanying foods, bread rolls with plant-based butter. Consider vegan chocolate options and coffee, plant-based cheese board options and canopies. Children's options are also required as sometimes it's a lifestyle choice for a family. And remember, it's not all about health. Junk and fried food also has its demand. Not all vegan dishes need to be clean, but ensure a balance. We're fortunate to have chefs who are educated and passionate about the topic and see it as a way to be creative and experiment with food. We're really proud that our menus are inclusive, we feel so. Jop shared recently that uh, after being served afternoon tea, and letting the team know that he was both dairy and gluten-free. He could keep everything that was presented to him. He didn't have to exclude any items. We currently have over 100 local products on our menus, and we're working on increasing that with the help of the soil farm and grow. So in our restaurants, our guests can enjoy food and beverage experiences focused on field or sea to plate, where guests can enjoy our experiential tours and tastings of fine local produce, and see and taste the same local ingredients on our menu. So today we're focusing on our plant-based offering. In front of you, you have a tomato and basil terrine, chestnut and mushroom croquettes with cherry dipping sauce, soil farm courgettes, I should say, and crispy quinoa, um, apricot and pistachio couscous with roasted vegetables, a mushroom and beetroot salad, and roasted aubergine with um, crispy onions, white bean puree, and cauliflower couscous. So I'll stop talking while you enjoy uh, sampling these dishes. We have got some lovely um, desserts coming out as well. So they are, I'll just say, vegan and gluten-free raspberry cream cheese and a vegan and gluten-free chocolate brownie, along with some fruit. Uh, we are going to take a break for, I think, about 15 minutes and then come back to the panel discussion. Thank you. Right. Um, I hope you all will agree that was um, it's been an absolutely lovely meal so far. Please keep eating. Um, just because of time, we're going to um, start going ahead with some uh, Q&A. And I get the um, honor of starting off, off with a few questions, which um, 
I will confess I did let them know in advance. But what I wanted to do was just take us from some uh, really interesting content, some, some excellent observations to action points. Um, we talked a lot about the complexity of the food system and the many choices that we as individuals, businesses, and the community um, are making with regard to food. So in terms of actions, I have three actions which I challenged my speakers with. Jock, if you were in charge of Guernsey, what three key actions on the food system would you take to improve the current way the system functions in our community and our impact on the world? Just keeping focused on food, yeah? Okay. Um, I think it's, as I said up front, I think it's always really complicated, um, but I'll have a go. I think if it was me starting tomorrow looking at, at, at Guernsey, uh, the first thing I want to do is understand what we're working with. I want to understand the landscape, how much we've got, how it's currently used, what quality. Because as I've said, I believe that food, the food system ought to be free of synthetic chemicals. And I think given that we're starting from such a low percentage point in Guernsey, if we're going to build a food system, there's no point in building a chemical food system. So I'd want to know what land we've got available, what it's currently used for, and, and undertake that audit. I think we'd also need to undertake some training and find people in the community wanting to work in the landscape. And I think there might be a perception that that job, when you're competing with a, with a relatively affluent economic environment and uh, you know the job landscape we've got I think is often considered to be a lower paying job and I don't think that needs to be the case if we so I think some training in in the appropriate um, in the appropriate skills necessary to work um, in regenerative food production in, in food and animal production um, and I think route to market is really interesting as well really important I don't I think I mean, I look at what James and Emma are doing with Rockets, and I think the products there is a great product. It competes. I think this is something else I would look to do is, is create a food infrastructure where the majority of the spend goes to the farmer. I think that's one of the ways of getting the money into the system is getting the price point of the food right. It's never going to be the cheapest food on the shelf, but getting the majority of that spend into the pocket of the person producing it, I think is one of the keys to underpinning. Um, I'd rather that initial support and right pricing than subsidizing so yeah i think landscape assessment training and then building a new infrastructure thank you interesting observations um vivian would you give us some perspective on three key actions individuals and companies should do to embrace a more sustainable food system um i think i'd like to kind of pick up on the three points that i'd kind of finished off with um and uh one of those was around your priority list um and really thinking about what's important to you what's important to your business i think uh much of our uh kind of food systems are ingrained whether they're personal food systems or wider food systems they're ingrained in habit um and those habits have changed significantly over the time um but very very rapidly and so the last 70 years and I think it's first of all just working out what those habits are um, and, and thinking about how we can change them um, I talked about the the balance plate as well and that's you know balancing what's on the plate but it's balancing it with quality you know really thinking about what we're putting on our plates and what we're putting into our bodies uh, what we're feeding our children what we're feeding our employees quality is so so important as as Jock keeps um alluding to um, and thinking about that 30 a week you know when you're balancing your plate don't balance it with the same foods it's it's the fact that you know we're eating the same foods because the monocropping industry is is just being perpetuated and whilst we think we might be having a diversity of foods it is the same foods that we're putting in so really really broaden uh, and 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 track how many foods you're eating a week it's an interesting activity um and crowding out with was the third point don't take the new year's resolution approach to change because by 
second day, you know, whether that's January the 2nd or Tuesday when Monday, everything starts Monday, you know, we, we've failed in our minds. Take that just one step at a time and just work out what that one step is. Choose that quite, quite literally low hanging fruit to, to start off with. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask Jill a little bit about your um, fascinating journey that the business has gone on toward a more sustainable food system. Do you have three pieces of advice you would give to local businesses to help them on their own sustainability journey? Well, it's important to say that we are still very much on our journey. Uh, we're still learning all the time. Um, and again, being a, a big business with investment in, in window solutions is is incredible but it doesn't have to be that it could be something very small and I always think about the guys from Innocent Smoothies when they wanted to set up their business they had two bins at a music festival trying to engage their customers it was it kept really simple so it's to find a, a waste uh, management system that's good for you and that can be very small um, and I also think engagement of teams the buy-in from our teams has been our, our greatest success and certainly locally what we have is um, we have a monthly tea party at both hotels, I have to attend to because I cover both hotels. That's terrible. But the chefs prepare uh, the, all the food that's on the menu and every single member of staff gets to try it. Um, and we celebrate, um, you know, uh, long service awards and, and different th things at this event on a monthly basis. But it just, again, it's just um, anybody in the in the hotel can tell you what's on the menu, which is great. Um, and, and the staff feel valued because of that as well, of that. Um, and be accountable. Like we are for everything we have monthly meetings it's not just about saying oh let's do this um this month and forget about it we have a spreadsheet that we fill in i know exactly how many single-use plastics we've managed to remove i know that we've installed thermostats on all our heated towel rails it's, it's an ongoing process and so and being accountable and having that uh, spreadsheet on a monthly basis to look at what we've achieved and where we want to go is really important okay thank you um, I'm going to do one more question, and that is um, something which is involves the states because they're asking for more money, and it involves Horace Camp, who's written lots of articles in the press about it, um, and that is Guernsey Dairy. Um, we've seen that um, cows and beef um, have got a, a large footprint here, um, but the Guernsey cow is regarded internationally as one of our most recognizable identifiers. We also know it produces an excellent product as well as having better health benefits than milk from other cows. Um, yet there are sustainability issues. So what are the opportunities for Guernsey Dairy in terms of investment, in terms of how it's placed, um, to become a poster child for sustainability? I'll take it. Um, I think with all questions, food, related and a little caveat um everyone we've spoken to already in the dairy industry has been proactive forward thinking open to dialogue open to change and i think that's a great starting point what my understanding of of the majority of our dairy industry is there is a, a synthetic chemical usage within within that um, industry and my starting point is I'd like that to be zero. Um, what we've what we've done with that is start dialogue to um, put some training and, and mentorship in place to transition that industry over a three to five year period. And I think that's where the opportunity lies is for me, you're quite right. It's a poster child that we could we could be working with that existing um lens internationally on our dairy and on our cattle breed and amplifying it by being entirely chemical free i think we can also it's not the cow it's the how i think we can also be improving our landscapes through our cattle um herds and if you follow nature mimicry when when herds move across landscapes they're through predators driving them they're followed by birds that um break up the manures and spread them around on on the landscape and feeding off some of the bugs in 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 the manures so i think there's opportunities immediately to diversify with things like chickens following cattle i think also when you when you run regenerative systems and you model the data that you see elsewhere on equivalent projects using guernsey cattle breed you can see that the there's a there's a terminology that a lady in Oxford used called cattle days per annum per acre. 
sorry, per acre per annum. So the number of days per year that a cow can spend on that acre. And she increased through changing over to regenerative um, farming principles using a Guernsey herd. Sasha will correct me if the data point's wrong here, but from six days per acre per annum to 60. So a tenfold increase on the use of that same bit of land, but doing so regeneratively and putting health back in. So I think we have huge opportunities. And for me, it's a question of building the relationship with the farmers that are used to being mandated and encouraging them to take up a training course and work with them to empower them ahead of what's written, you know, legislations that are likely coming in, in fertilizer and other things. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity with our dairy industry to fly a much, much better flag. Um, so I'm going to pass my prerogative over to all of you. Um, if anybody's got any questions for our panelists, I've got one from Paul there. Mike's coming your way. Uh, thank you very much uh, for an insightful uh, and illuminating um, talks. I'm kind of, there's one word that keeps coming back to me, it's choice. Um, how do we make this accessible for those who don't have choice? Um, for those who get left behind, for those who actually, we, we've all paid 25 pounds to be here today. And for some people, they don't have that to spend a week. Um, so how does this new way of being, which we're, we're all behind, how do we roll out that for people who have perhaps 12 pounds a week and in winter have to choose between heating and eating? Um, I'm just really curious as to how this rolls out for everybody so that no one gets left behind. Thank you. So the question was on um, how we, how these food systems that we're envisioning can support those that are left behind. Um, I would love to say that I have the answer. Um, I don't, I completely and utterly agree with you, Paul. Um, uh, I volunteer for Guernsey Welfare every week um collecting the food donations from the food boxes in Waitrose which in itself is a very privileged thing to say that a that I've got a car to be able to take it and and b that we've got a Waitrose where we're buying you know a range of quality food um and and every week I, I look in that box and I see heavily processed highly refined foods um and it breaks my heart because we're perpetuating a system um and when I take that food in or I'm asked when I take that food in not to prioritize taking um wholemeal bread because the preference is for white bread our um our tastes have been so driven by kind of marketing that we are we have a much sweeter tooth uh, we are driven by shelf life um, and 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 so there's there's a big uh, opportunity to be able to educate I think in terms of uh, how we use the food and um, the type of food that we're using um, and 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 winning over by taste um, I'd uh, it's, that's a really difficult question Paul I, I don't have the answer but I think it's it's a collective thing and something that Jock and I have spent a lot of time talking about, and you can probably make a more valuable um, build on. I'll add a little something. <laughs> um, Paul, I, uh, I'll echo that whilst we've been focused on, on changing that 4% and building a food system, the price point thing comes up all the time. And it's one of the most challenging questions I ask myself is how we bring that price of food down so it's accessible for everybody in it. but I also have to ask the question the other way how do we make the price of food relevant so that the farmer's not the guy that's getting hammered because the farmers should be some of the most important people in our community in terms of um, we need them so I think we have to figure out a solution that works both ways and this is where I find the challenge I think Viv's already made some really valid points um, I think there's various ways I suspect that the first improvements on that four percent won't be at the low price point that's my first thought is that the to build an infrastructure here we need to um we need to invest and that's not going to come at the cheapest price point that typically comes afterwards right so in product development but i do think things like we're going to need some labor and if you were to come and give me an hour i can give you 20 pounds worth of food and that equates to one of our weekly veg boxes 
So I can give you a week's veg from our system for nothing if you can give me an hour. So I can take the price out of the equation in a way. And I also think um, another idea we've been talking about is if there's corporate uh, businesses in the room that have good cash flow and they buy a week, uh, weekly veg box and stick it in the office, they could buy a second one and we could find systems where we could put that into other systems where the price is taken off and we can distribute it so we can aggregate the pricing over the system without affecting the price point of the food for the farmer. So these are just some of the ideas we've been playing with, but you're right, it's a question we're asking all the time. And I, I suspect as that percentage gets higher in a local context, we can do even more with it. But to start with, I think we're gonna to have to be innovative and creative with how we, how we try and address the price point. We've got a question, um, Jenny? A, a microphone's just coming your way. Following from what Jock had said. There you go, the microphone. Oh, thank you. Following on from what Jock has said and the veg box idea, one of the things that I've always noticed about those who are strapped for cash is that they don't buy vegetables and they don't eat vegetables, certainly not fresh ones. They will use tinned ones. And there's nothing wrong with tinned ones, of course. But how do we encourage the learning how to cook with fresh food? It was taken away in the national curriculum in 1988 from schools, and we've suffered ever since, I think, as a result. So how do we improve that? So how do we improve that? sort of skill base of, of cooking and particularly including fresh vegetables I think Viv said it before I don't have all the answers but I've got an idea um, I think there's genuine opportunity when you look at um, workforce to create secondary industries of food where and even in the college of FE kitchen you were talking about before um, if we've got a load of tomatoes that are on their sell-by date, or right now we've got more courgettes than we know what to do with, we can make convenience food in our local kitchens, create an industry, create a business, and, and get fresh food to people if they're not willing or not able to make it for themselves. But I think we have to start somewhere and work back to where we're... we're I myself, as a veg box producer now, wouldn't consider myself the ideal veg box customer. <laughs> because I have this pattern of what I buy in the shops and seasonality is another thing we're gonna to have to get our heads around if we wanna change the food industry. So um, getting people to engage with different foods, I think is in, gonna be in part through food experiences, through menus like Jill's putting on the table to hear everyone around the table saying this food's delicious. I think it might not be what everyone would have ordered if they'd have had a menu, but I think putting taste experiences in place and the more we can do with that, the more we can start to answer these questions. But I think we've got to start somewhere and work towards these. Again, price point is a, is a big, big challenge and it's something we can work towards. But I think everyone here, regardless of their income, has got an hour. And so if, we, if we're motivated to want to change our own food choices, we can give an hour towards doing that. And so then it, for me, there's a, Pretend, you know that's a level playing field yeah I would the only thing that I would add to that is again just to mention Guernsey Welfare I know that they are running a number of cookery classes um, within the charity to be able to to support those healthier decisions and and using food you know well any other questions yes right next to Jen uh, well, my concern is for food security in Guernsey. I live in St. Peter's near three very large uh, vineries. One is currently um, rented to a commercial grower, probably the, the last commercial vegetable grower in the island. The other two are empty. Now, I understand that two of these vineries, including the one is rented to the grower, are earmarked for cannabis growing, and probably the third one is too. So what could the states do um, to help secure these uh, important uh, vineries for our food security rather than let them go to cannabis or fall down as many of our vineries have already done. 
<laughs> Thanks, Marguerite. Um, I'll take that first. I don't know if others want to add. Um, with my soil farm hat on, I can tell you that most of the soil testing and assessment we do in vineries, unsurprisingly, shows a legacy of heavy chemical use. Um, they're riddled, a lot of them. And so they need work to remediate that chemical out of the system before we start producing food in them. Um, for the record, the food system we're producing is entirely in substrate we make ourselves um, from local waste. So we're mitigating that. I think greenhouses present a real opportunity if we can get over that initial um, problem of what's in the ground in them. Yeah, so exactly, get a different substrate in. Um, raised beds at scale is huge cost and infrastructure and volume. So we're doing it in a no dig system, which is closer to the ground, but yeah, uh, different substrate. Um, I think there is huge opportunity to, there's a lot of cost of infrastructure in those greenhouses. And, and I think a balance of greenhouse and outdoor space is probably the best way to increase seasonality, diversity, opportunity for food production in the island. And there are a number of really good examples. Many of them are going over to cannabis, you're quite right. Um, we'll see with the way that industry is playing out how many of them stay there. I didn't say that out loud. We're not recording, are we? <laughs> um, so yeah, I think there's huge opportunities in greenhouses. Again, for me, it comes down to price point. It comes down to the financial viability of, it's often a six figure sum to starting point to recondition those things. And if you're working, I think what we have, we have estates who have a huge amount of list of things to do, and they're continually um, choosing what goes to the top of the list. And a lot of those choices are made by the, the, the island conversation. And that's very much part of what this event is about, is to, to see where the island view is and to raise those questions. And um, we have two deputies here today, so thank you very much for coming. Um, but I think that it's important for all of us. Um, we've got some 10 key takeaways there. Um, and and it is that sort of, not only is it the pound you're spending, but it's the voice that you're using with those choices. So if these things are important to you, um, then we need to make our voices heard and we need to to um, continue this conversation elsewhere with the, within your uh, company, within your community organizations. And, and we need to indicate that this is quite important because it goes across the board. It's, it's, it's integral to our housing strategy. People are shouting about the cost of housing but then are we gonna build on the greenfield? So it keeps linking back, all these things are connected um, and we just need to keep the conversation going. One other point, I think on where you're pointing out, I agree with you, food security is right up there, whether it's quality, availability, locality. As a business that's stepping into food production, what we would really benefit from is a little financial support to take out the early stage risk where we're having to fund it ourselves. And that doesn't necessarily for me need to come from the States. It needs to come from somewhere because the price of land and the price of the big granite houses on the end of it in Guernsey is artificially high. If we were doing this, we've modeled it. If we were doing this in the South of England or North of Italy, we could afford to do it ourselves. In Guernsey, we can't because there is that artificially high cost and there's the cost of infrastructure. So I think the money will need to come from somewhere to de-risk the initial transition and potentially, but all the rest of the costs I think we're comfortable with. And certainly if you model the price of food at level with Waitrose Organic, which is a section that's growing bigger and bigger, so it shows there's a demand, then the cost of running the business longer term I don't think is a problem. I think it's that initial transition for me is where, but I agree with you, food security right up there. Great, sorry, we're running on with time. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Is there any? We've got one over there, thank you. It's not a question, just a point of information, really. I'm a trustee for Edible Guernsey, and we have a community garden in St. Peter's where anyone can come along and volunteer, take home produce that they've helped grow, 
uh, we have our vision is to help Guernsey become self-sufficient for food and uh, that's going to be a long way in the future obviously but anybody who's interested can come along help out there's education sessions to learn how to grow particular plants and um, we actually do have some cookery demonstrations sometimes as well some very interesting foods produced so edible.gg is the website and anybody who's interested um, take a look and you're always welcome to come along thank you Thank you very much for that. That's really useful. I think it's been useful to sort of spread a lot of the information about the Health Improvement Commission, what's going on at Edible. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening here. Okay, one more quick one. Coming back to your early point about the poster child, um, I think obviously we've directly focused on Guernsey in this conversation, but clearly we're not the only island economy facing these same challenges. So I think the question of poster child actually is much broader than just promoting the island in its own right and that getting these sorts of decisions right from a strategic perspective and finding ways to put the infrastructure in place benefits both us and potentially then becomes a way of effectively selling Guernsey's IP more broadly elsewhere because certainly you, know, you think of places like Bermuda, Cayman, lots of other jurisdictions with similar characteristics have got the same problem. Um, and when we had the marine uh, lunchtime lecture a couple of months ago, you know, the Marine Institute as a means of sharing information and understanding, you know, is there a way of effectively doing more of that from here? A very interesting point. Um, and I think there's come back to opportunities around that opportunities for our food culture, opportunities to lead and share that information. And um, because it, it, it is complex and it's complex about the, the way things are getting here, um, the, the inputs that we have. So I think there's a there's a, a lot more to be discussed in this area. Um, I'm going to close now. We've left up here 10 key takeaways. Um, they're going to be on the Chamber website, um, but it really is, um, you know, that there's there are lots that you can do. Don't get overwhelmed by it start a little bit um you can you can uh, you know change things as you do but you all are empowered to change and there's a lot of ways here in which you can do that um i'd like to um end by where's the clicker here's the clicker um there's a few resources so winner food solutions was um mentioned by um, jill um there's um, both Viv and, and, and Jock are happy to help out with their areas of expertise. Um, if you want to get more involved with the Sustainable Business Initiative, um, you can email us at the Office of Chamber. We'd love to have your voice join our conversation. Um, and we are having a next meeting, People, Planet and Pints, on the 14th of July. Details will be on the Chamber website soon. Um, so I would like to close by thanking um, all the people that were involved today, very much. Thank you very much for the Health Improvement Commission for coming. I learned a lot. I knew some of what you did, but that was really interesting to see all the projects you've got. Um, the speakers have um, put a lot of time into really trying to trying to trying to touch all the different complexities. And that was something we started with. It's such a complex system. How can we um, um, encourage us? Hope, hopefully you've come away with some interesting insight into um, our food systems, both internationally and what happens here in Guernsey. Um, and I wanted to, to say a final huge thanks to Jill and her team at OGH for an amazing meal. I hope you haven't missed the meat um, and I hope you've enjoyed and, and uh, it was really a chance for the OGH team to show, show off what they can do with plant-based diet. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm going to hand you over to Laura. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, yes, big thank you to, to Jennifer and the panel and, and to Lucy for talking today and to everyone for coming along. This is the third of, of a series of panel events we've been doing at Chamber um, and this concludes that. We're going to take a, a short break over the summer period and we'll be back in September for our next lunch with Diane Degare, the new president of the Guernsey Chamber. Um, just very quickly, if you're getting in touch and please do if you want to be involved in SBI, it's office at guernseychamber.com just to make sure you get around to the right place. Um, but you know, call us up. Our details all, are all online. So um, thank you very much. And, and I think we've heard today definitely the amount of opportunity that's out there and, and the fact that uh, it's all up to us really to, to make it happen. So thank you very much. And thank you to everyone in attendance. <laughs>